Hello and welcome to everyone that is joining us today from wherever you are. I hope you are keeping safe and are keeping warm. I hope you have also um, remembered to tag a friend. If you haven't, it's not too late to do that. And so today we thought that one of the things we could be speaking, we can, we can speak about today is um, just around us not being able to gather as a church. What has that taken away from us? Was it even a good call? You know, you might be sitting at home and thinking to yourself, oh man, Christians are so weak. We should have been gathering. We should have been going to church, praying and all of that. Um, and so we just want to invite you today so that we all come in conversation and we all try to find a place, a, um, a comfortable middle around the topic. Um, and so, yeah, if you have any questions, please remember to pop them down in the comment section. And so I think I'm just going to kick us off today by inviting um, Rebecca and Els to just share their thoughts around us not gathering as a church. So I know that for most of us, when we heard that um, it is now illegal to gather as a church, there were, we had um, varying views. Some people thought to themselves, this is the worst thing to happen in the history of the church. And yet some people thought to themselves, this is the most responsible uh, thing to happen. Some people thought, geez, man, how are we going to pray? How are we going to be there? Are we now ceasing to exist as a church? I even know that there were people who quoted scriptures like Hebrews. I think it's 1025 that says, do not neglect the gathering of the saints. And so let me throw it out to you guys. Was it a good call? Was it a bad call? Which side of the fence are you on? Um, I think that it is, I think our leaders have been put in such difficult positions because they have, um, they've had to make a decision for their congregation and they've had to have the weight of uh, this massive decision, even though it has been, um, the government has made the decision for us, we had to abide by whatever our leaders have um, decided for us. So I think that there's been a massive weight on leaders' shoulders. And we know biblically that when you step into um, a, role, a, a role of leadership in the church, you are held to a higher standard, you are judged harsher. And so I think that it has been a massive um, difficulty for some leaders to make the decision and someone said to me the other day Rebecca what do we do a non-Christian asked me the other day what do we do uh, what do you do as Christians when Jesus gives you the great commission which is go out make disciples go into every nation go obviously being a verb being a doing word now what do you do when it's literally illegal to do um what I just just if we look at Matthew 28, just quickly, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but uh, when we look in Matthew 28, um, it speaks about the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where, this is verse 16, and the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And then I'm gonna skip a little bit to 18. All the authority in heaven has been given to me. And this is the crux of it where verse 19 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing, the, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded to do, you to do. So we have this scripture, which is just almost central to the Christian faith that we go and we make disciples out of people. Yet the most Christian thing to do at the moment is to stay at home. So how do we grapple with the great commission but how do we grab and then versus the parallel of the greatest the bravest thing you can do as a christian is stay at home the greatest witness as a christian is to stay at home it's completely against our dna um i i, I find it fascinating at the moment i've had a difficulty with how do we evangelize during this time but then we look at acts and how the church meets in small groupings, they meet in small places. So maybe it is actually the world correcting itself, you know, back to the way that it used to be. And I'm, I wanna just suggest to anyone watching, I highly recommend re during this time reading Letters to the Church by Francis Chan. And he's, he went from a mega church and he stepped down and he started small churches. And I'm not saying that corporate gathering is bad. I actually, I love the corporate church. I 
absolutely love it. And so I'm really struggling during this time, but I think it could be a resetting of the church's priorities. Sorry, Ilsa, I feel like I'm- No, I think, no, definitely. I think it's, it's definitely that. I've also been wondering about those things this time and, and it's awesome that you bring up Acts because in this time um, after Easter, I decided I was gonna read um, the book of Acts in my personal devotion time. And I thought it would be such a relevant book. And what I found is it's so profound in this time of lockdown actually of how this church um, just adapts and adapts and adapts and adapts and still in that adapt adaptation still finds a way to be relevant. I've often heard people say that we have to, in order to be the true to true church we have to go back to being the church of act um, and especially the acts to church and that if we look is where they like, gather together every day they shared their meals they share communion they gather together for prayer and that's almost you know how we as the corporate church as you described it we meet and we gather maybe not as often as they did for every meal but we meet and we gather and then in Acts 8 we see how persecution comes and this church is scattered the reality is they weren't meeting as they were. They're scattered into different places, different homes, different countries, and yet the church still exists. And it's again that the church is called to reimagine. The church is called to think of a way of how do we be the church without it? You know, we find that they were still a community. When you read those letters in Acts, and I've just been amazed at this book, of how you find this great sense of community. As soon as Paul, um, or any of the apostles come to a place where there's a fellowship of believers, they're welcome because there's a sense of community. Whether they've met them before or not, there's a sense of community. And so community is, in this case, not through proximity, but it's through yeah. love, which is found in compassion, it's found in care, it's found in connecting with people in different and creative ways. And essentially that is about love and how do we spread love in this time. I've also been looking, like Rebecca, you said, um, at Galatians and how do we do this great commission thing? Because usually this is the way that we do church by, you know, going and baptizing. And we need to reimagine how we are as a church. But we can only do that once we accept this state that we're in as our new reality as a church. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it is also very helpful, you know, because I think all of us are agreeing here on this particular platform and you maybe at home must still be kind of um, struggling with this whole idea. But I think there's a consensus here that um, we are called to reimagine our existence. Mm. And the answer might actually be closer than we think. It might be inverted in how we used to do church. Um, which I will kind of also throw a spanner around just now. But just before we do that, I thought it might be nice to, to draw a particular scripture. Very odd scripture for the topic in question, unless you understand it in context. In 1 Corinthians 13, um, verse 4 to verse 7, it reads as follows. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. Now, here's my point of emphasis. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now, one of the things that's obviously when you understand that scripture in context, you'd understand that Paul is speaking to a particular community divided over various stuff. But all in all, what he then says to them is even their spiritual gift and their existence and their sense of community must be fueled by love. Yeah. Without, it is meaningless. But then in verse 7, he continues to go when he describes this love that must fuel the sense of community is that love protects. Now, if I would go out and make myself vulnerable to being a carrier of a virus that spreads through physical proximity and then insist on gathering on a Sunday, yeah. I am not protecting those around me. You know, and so for me, the one thing that has given me comfort that, yes, we are called to exist as a body, but we cannot neglect the fact that we are called to exist as a body out of love yeah. and love to protect one another. Now, next banner. Let's, um, so while we try to reimagine church, what then happens to the old lady? So I want us to kind of 
acknowledge some of the things that people might be complaining about and might be struggling with and stuff that we're probably struggling with and might not have answers to is yeah. while we gather as a church, one of the things that I'm still wrestling with is while we gather, while we say, let's reimagine our way of gathering, let us gather in small communities. Um, what then happens to those around us who one, live alone, two, find themselves in a situation where their families and loved ones are in another country and there is no way they could have organized before the lockdown to gather with them. What happens also to issues such as, man, I struggle with race issues and outside of the church gathering, I do not find a safe space that can challenge my worldview because now I'm just stuck with my family that looks like me. No one is different from me. And therefore, my worldview will not be challenged. I'm now stuck in the space that reinforces how I think and how I do life. I've gathered with, um, I, I remember at one of the um, men, men's meetings we had, and this guy said, my daughter goes to University X, and she always comes back and she challenges me. She's changed how I think because of her experience of varsity. She's yeah. challenged my thinking around sexuality, around race, around gender issues. But now, she's now stuck at home. And it means that we are all stuck with one another. And there aren't much spaces that will now challenge our worldview. So that, you know, so how do we navigate such issues? And also around issues of outreach, compassion, praying for one another when a family is going through a difficult time. People have fears and insecurities around that. And that's why some people really miss the church. How do we meet people where they are when it comes to that? Yeah, and I get, and I think I get another, oh, sorry, else you go for it. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I've just been thinking around, you know, your first question of how do we meet people um, like those that are staying by themselves and how do we access people without being proximate to them? How do we still um, have that sense of community without proximity? And like I said just now, it was about this concept of love. And I got thinking about, there's this book by um, Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. And so what he writes about in this book is you've got five, people have got five love languages. The words of affirmation, acts of service, gift giving or receiving, and quality time and physical touch. And so the, the crux of it is that we all have different ways of experiencing and showing love to other people. And I got thinking about how actually it's still possible to share the love of Jesus without physically gathering as a church and physically being in each other's spaces. And it was something like maybe this doesn't quite, this example doesn't quite apply in the time of lockdown, but something like looking at net florists nowadays you don't have to be physically in the same place as someone to be able to see if your love language is gift giving to give them a gift there's still ways of showing that love and expressing your love genuinely through your love language um, mm -hmm. and the other person's love language without actually being physically there other stuff like um, words of affirmation or Zoom call, um, words of affirmation or quality time. We can do that over like Zoom call. I know it's not the same, but again, if this is our new reality and it's not easy, that has to be said. That's a disclaimer that this isn't easy. But if this is the way it has to be, we have to make ways of, or find ways of doing the best and making the best out of it. The only question then is around access. And I believe our role as a church is then also to provide access. And that we see in how the church was challenged to include the Gentiles, to include people who weren't part of the original covenant people. And, you know, it might be a case of our role shifting from literally physically helping people gather to helping people gather in online spaces, helping them connect. Maybe our role as a church is to find ways of bringing in experts. You know, we can't think that we can do this alone. And that's the beauty of this is that as a church, we no longer operate alone. We no longer are the experts, but we have to bring in other experts to help us connect. You know, maybe it's a case of providing access to data, or maybe it's a case of, um, you know, there's so many different ways, but part of our role as a church and our responsibility to respond in this time is to find ways to include people that are not connected. And that challenges us. To come back to your question around how we challenge is, that challenges us to think beyond our family circle, but to think of those that are not part of our circle and how do we include them to be part of the circle? Sure, love it, man, love it, eh? Yeah, and I think, like, I, 
So much of it, Ilse said, I think that, uh, so my love language is quality time, but not quite like I, as in full attention, don't be doing anything else but speaking to me. All your attention needs to be on me. Quality time number is my number one love language. My mom will attest to that. <laughs> number one love language, hence this is the perfect time for me to enter this discussion. Yeah, quality, so, dedicated time. So mom, we just like, we're just speaking around like the church has left the building mm -hmm. and what does that mean? How have you felt it like as someone who's had, as a leader has, has had to make some really difficult calls um, around meeting as people? And I know that you've had some people that don't really understand the decision you've made. And just maybe can you speak around how you and Samilo and Ben and have had to make decisions for people and how it's affected you and how you think we can connect during mm -hmm. lockdown? lockdown. You know, I think one of the biggest things um, that lockdown, you know, I think the timing of lockdown has been really interesting. Um, and it was right in the middle of our Easter preparations. And it was kind of towards the end of Lent. So it, it, it found us at a time where we were already searching. And the sense is that we kind of had this normal that we'd created. And mm. there was a sense that this normal was really not helping us. And um, I think that, you know, I think that sometimes I, I was thinking today, just we are a people of a couple of things. We're a people of history. So history is always part of what we do. We are a people of the present, but we are mm. also the people of possibilities. Wow. So for me, it's like to find the possibilities in the current situation. I must be honest with you, my huge stress is for people that cannot access the platforms that we have available. So it's, well, what do we do about that? So it's not just about who's in the platform, but who's not in the platform. Yeah. And, and I suppose somehow it's, it's to live in the disruption of the resurrection. I think we forget how disruptive the resurrection season was. And, you know, as we encounter this new normal, it's to live in this whole new disruption and to, to actually allow the deep reset. I think that sometimes yeah. we... We keep kind of want to go back to what was normal, but actually, let's not go back there. Yeah. Let's go to a deep reset. So, yeah, we had to make some tough decisions, but um, I think that these are just decisions we're going to have to make along the way. Yeah. So, it's great to be with you on this platform. I'm going to go make tea. Oh, okay. Can you make me some? Okay. Um, Thanks, Jackie. I just saw what my mom was saying. Um, I think things resetting and going back to what they were. There's so many times I find myself on Zoom or on FaceTime or on WhatsApp calls. Where I'm like, I just wish it wasn't my first. I would, um, so I'm engaged with someone who lives in London. And so we have no way to see each other at the moment. And we just often in phone calls are quite sad and, and quite like, well, this is, but like, this is a sad situation. And the truth is that Chris and I, a form of selflessness, is not seeing each other. A form of selflessness is, even though it's really difficult on us, it's ensuring the safety of all the other people around us. And that is the new commission. I would, like, obviously that's not what the new commission is, but there's almost seems to be an ad adaptable commission. And I just love what you guys are, but I love the way that, where this has gone, because it's so easy to look at scripture and be like, oh, well, the church should be meeting as like six people, the church should be doing this. But actually, Tony, you've highlighted that love is actually from where we react out of. We react out of love. And also bringing in the five languages, it's actually like, it's completely relevant because it's, it's how we experience love and that's not how we, that's not how we will be, experiencing it conventionally you know so, uh, so so i think we're now at this place where again we say in as much as our gatherings might not be the same might not be what they used to be when we used to gather in the church in the physical building um but our gatherings are still valid and yes there might be someone who's out there all alone and there is a sense in which there is a community around them, even though they are, you know, there's that beautiful saying that um, online spaces enable community without proximity, you know, and we're still trying to figure our way around some things, you know, there's still questions around our Christian rituals, how do we continue those online and all of that. But if there's one thing we do know is that the premise from which we act is that of love. And as we gather in our various spaces, 
online, through online platforms. We continue to be fueled by love and out of a desire to protect one another. Now, kicking towards the end, a thing that I thought maybe, you know, so one of the things that I noticed, even when um, just um, looking at how our past as a, um, as, 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 as a faith community is informed by moments like this, you know, we learn even from like Jewish, let's say, let's look at the Jewish religion, where at some point they find themselves in Babylon and suddenly they cannot gather at the temple and they need to gather in synagogues, you know? And that was actually, it actually, it, at that moment when it happened, it seemed as though it was a grave disruption. One of the things when you read, when you read throughout Jewish scripture, they mourn the temple, they, they miss the temple, but at that moment they find a different way of gathering that they still continue to gather through till this very day, you know? And then you go on and you look at, in our own history, you look at how the industrial revolution disrupts the home space, where the home space used to be the center of the church. You know, church used to be used to support the home space and enable the home space to continue ministry. But the industrial revolution disrupts that because suddenly people have to go work in the cities. And as a result, we've got this huge, this emphasis, this focus on the corporate, uh, on corporate worship again. Um, but then COVID-19 also then does a counter-revolution to the industrial revolution. And suddenly we're now back in the home space and we now have to get in the home space and relearn how to do church in the home space. And suddenly the church has to assume the role of a support system. Now the church supports the home space and enables the home space to do ministry as opposed to the home space enabling church to do ministry. You know, and for me, that was something that really stood out that we could hold on to. And I just thought I should throw it back to you guys in the few minutes that remain that what are some of the things that we can then hold on to as far as doing church? What is on your hearts as far as doing church after COVID-19 and beyond? Um, I th just for myself, just quickly, um, Galatians 4, 13 says this. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh rather serve one another humbly in love. I think it's important, we have so much freedom, freedom in Christ, freedom in this world, freedom to do what we want. And technically we do still have freedom um, in this moment. We're not being policed every second of every day. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. I think even when we become, out, when we get out of this lockdown, when we are able to gather as a congregation again. I think to keep the principles that we learn now, that we learned um, during this time, and I don't know what you've learned, but I, I've certainly learned that selflessness looks different to what it looked like before this. Mm -hmm. And I think to continue to walk humbly that once we get out of this um, COVID-19, not to, um, I, I've been speaking to tons of people like the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go out and have, not that that's a bad thing at all, because I can't wait to go have a pizza at a restaurant. But I think just to <laughs> remind ourselves of how privileged we were during this time and, and to continue to walk in that humility. I think definitely. And like for me, it's been a lot around, I love what you said about remembering those principles. If something this lockdown has taught me, it was around us being um, different parts of the body. Before there was so much focus on the body, and now there's focus on the different parts of the body. And we find this in um, 1 Corinthians 12. And if you go read that, that chapter, you find how it speaks about how we're all um, part of this one body of Christ, but how each part is important. And that's a principle that I've learned in this time, that at times, my role of the body or my part of the body that I am is to be. And so that would be like your frontline workers who are your, your doctors and your nurses, your grocers, your bankers, uh, the police, whoever is on the front lines at the moment. Their way of being part of the body and being faithful is by doing and being out there. And for, for some of us, it's about being home. And so just remembering that principle of we're different parts of the body and each of us is important to that body. And that helps us when we go back out of a time of COVID or lockdown to remember each person is important. Absolutely, man. Also, I really love that, you know. And I think for myself personally, one thing that really stands out is just um, the value of community. 
Mm. You know, um, as that online spaces are not just places where we go and troll one another, you yeah. know, but that they can be used for really, really important stuff. And suddenly we realize how much we all mean to one another. I've gotten to know some people more than I would have outside of lockdown, you know. Um, and so, yeah, man. And so I think wherever you are at home, um, I think first, let me just throw it to you guys. Any closing words, any closing remarks? If you, Because from my side, it's just to say, wherever you are, do you know that church has left the building? Church has not ceased to exist, yeah. but we have just left the building. And we now gather in different spaces. And look, I think also, Rebecca, there's something um, uh, our lecture once said, which I think he spoke about the Great Commission. And he says, um, ideally, church should end on a Sunday with each person being commissioned to the primary community that they belong to, and that is their family. And so I hope that all of us will feel that we've all been commissioned into our home spaces, to those around us, to those online. And let's just close in prayer. But just before we do that, I just want to remind you that we've got various online platforms on which we're going to be running our Bible studies. Zoom, the, um, the, 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 the password will go out soon. Um, look out on our, social sp- on, on our social media spaces. We'll also be on Instagram and we'll also be on Facebook. That's every Tuesday at 8 o'clock. We're going to be un- un- unpacking what we spoke about today even more in depth. And so let us close in prayer. Yeah. And so God, we thank you, God, that we can still continue to worship and gather in our different corners. We thank you, God, that even though, Lord, we um, are fearful around the stuff that is happening around us and maybe filled with fear, but our hope is just something that can never be taken away from us, Lord. And we pray that as we continue to do church at home, as we continue to do church online, that God, we may, we may, we may realize more of your omnipresence and where that we may too may um, find, find resonance, God, in the words of David, where he, when he says, where can I run from your presence? To where can I flee from your presence? No matter where I go, your presence is always there with me. God, may that become our reality. We thank you pray for all of this. In your name, Lord Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Have a blessed Sunday. Bye, guys. Bye.